If you are trying to buy a house in this hot Colorado Springs market, how in the heck are you supposed to stand out among all those other buyers that are competing for the same house? How are you supposed to get the okay from the seller that you're the one they're chosen, choosing? So I've got eight tips for you on that and stay tuned towards the end because I've got five major mistakes to avoid. You know, we do these uh, videos every week about living, working, and playing in Colorado Springs. So I'll invite you to subscribe to the channel, hit that little bell so you get reminded when we get another one. And let's go take a look at uh, these tips. All right then, let's take a look at these eight tips for of getting into a bidding war and a few things to avoid at all costs. Here's the first one. Shop below your limit. I'm gonna use the same number throughout all these examples. So. Let's say you're looking at a $400,000 home and several in that price range and you're just loving it and they're great. And you've been through a bunch of them. And then you get the word from your lender that you're only good for 350. Well, you should have found that out first, right? So you know what you're looking for. And that's one price you need to know or amount you can handle. And the other one is the monthly charge. So it's not just the price of the house, but it's how much can you do a month and still get all your other bills paid and still feel comfortable? So make sure you get with your lender, get pre-approved. They will uh, take all your financials and get you a good number that you can take to the marketplace. One thing you might do is have your broker uh, check with a seller or the other agent, find out what the seller might be interested in. We assume incorrectly that it's everybody wants the same thing, which would be you know, top dollar cash if they can get it closed quickly, all that kind of stuff. But not everybody's that way. Um, so it doesn't hurt to uh, have your broker ask the other broker, what's your seller looking for? Is there anything we can offer that uh, might sweeten the pot for them? And just uh, be quiet and let them speak and find out what they might need. One of the things they might need is they know if they sell their house, then they get their money and they're ready to buy. but. Now they've got to be out of their house in 30 days or whatever the closing is. And uh, that's going to be really like virtually impossible to do. So one thing you can offer is a lease back, it's called. So you buy the house, you close on June 1st, but you say you can stay in the house for another month or 45 days, whatever you guys work out. And there will be a rental agreement that will be, you know, legal and written down. And then they will have some breathing room. As a buyer, if you can do this, it's a nice thing to do. And it's also uh, might get you in the door. It's better than getting turned down when somebody else offers something great. So it's something to consider. Here's something not many people think about is offer to pay the moving costs. Now, if they're moving across town or up to Woodland Park or something, that's a reasonable thing. If they're moving to Miami, you might wanna double check your numbers and make sure that's in the ballpark. Otherwise, don't offer this one if they're going too far and find out how much money that would actually cost you. But you can pay their seller costs, their closing costs. Uh, when you uh, close the deal on, at the title company, uh, there will be a sheet for you and a sheet for them, and it'll show all the extra charges you have coming to you. The buyers have a few, the sellers have a few more. Some are split in half. But uh, one thing you can do is just say, hey, I'll take your uh, closing costs, whatever they are, I'll take care of them. You don't have to worry about them. It's more money in your pocket, and that might be an incentive for them. Another one might be to pay their property taxes. Again, if they're closing on June 1st, uh, they owe money for the five months that they owned it, and the bill comes to you in February for the entire year. So, in ge generally, what happens is at closing, the uh, seller gets dinged for the first five months or whatever it is of the property tax so that it goes over to your side so that when the uh, bill comes due next February, you've got the money in hand. But if you're in a position to do it, you could say, hey, I'll take care of that property tax for you. Don't you even worry about it. I'll take care of it and uh, you've got more money in your pocket. So one more idea for you. Another one is put down a larger earnest money amount. Usually the earnest money that they ask for is 1% of the sale price. So for on a $400,000 house, it'll say in the uh, listing, earnest money to such and such a title company is going to be $4,000. And you want to make an impression and you've got some money in the bank. So you could say, I'll put down $10,000 for earnest money. 
that makes a big splash because everybody else is coming by that uh, asked for 4,000 and you come up two and a half times that. And the good news is for you, you can still get out of it if the deal goes bad, if the inspection comes back and shows something you don't want to deal with or any other problem arises. There's several ways to get out legally and ethically and get your money back. So you don't really risk anything if you've got it. That's something to try out maybe. Plus, it counts towards your uh, final payment, so it's a good thing. And the last thing is a controversial one for sure, writing a love letter, which is basically um, telling the seller, oh, you've got the best house. It's just, it was made for me, and I love whatever, make, pick something, your garden, and I'm a big gardener, and I want to continue working in this beautiful garden. Something like that. Um, might have an effect. Talk with your broker about it because not everybody uh, thinks these are a good idea. And if you do go ahead and do it, uh, make sure you stay away from what are called protected classes. These are things that are in the anti-discrimination laws. And so you can't uh, discriminate either plus or minus about age, sex, origin, um, several others, disability. You can't uh, mention any of that stuff in your letter. So run it by your uh, uh, broker first, your agent, and get their sign off. They won't want to read the letter probably uh, because then they could get involved if something goes sour. They should be just out of the loop. So <clears throat> here's some things that buyers are messing up on. The first one you'd think would be a no-brainer, but a lot of people do this. Let's say they're going out for the $400,000 home. They're looking at them from 395 to 410 and they're going in and out of them. They're finding a beautiful neighborhood and these beautiful immaculate homes. And then they decide they want one and they go to line up their lender and the lender says, you're only good for 350. Well, you've wasted a lot of people's time and yours especially. So make sure you know ahead of time what you're qualified for. And not only what the lender will lend you for the house, but how much your monthly payments are as well. Because if the overall price seems good, but it's way over your monthly budget and you can't possibly afford it, you better know that up front so you know exactly what you can pay for. Um, another kind of related thing is making a down payment that's too small. Now there's some people out there, and you may be among them, that uh, they are looking for the smallest down payment. They go for zero down if they could get it. And if you're a veteran, you could do that um, with a VA loan. But the rest of us, the best you can get is a 3.5% loan generally on an FHA loan, if you otherwise qualify. So you're a long way from the magic number of 20% down. You do not need 20%. But the advantage is, if you have 20% down, you're not paying an additional fee for mortgage insurance. That they'll tack on if you're below 20%. So if you've got the money, put down the 20, because that's a good thing. So on 400000 that's an $80,000 down payment, so you'd have to be saving up for a long time, probably, to put that kind of money together. But if you can, then your loan is only for three twenty. dollars If you put down 3.5%, then your loan is almost the full $400,000. So your monthly payments are going to be much higher, even with the same interest rate. So if you can afford it, put down a little bit more on the monthly payment, or on the... Uh, down payment and reduce your monthly payments. Another mistake they make is not looking or knowing about maybe first time buyer programs. There's a lot of ways that their government is encouraging home buyers. And there's federal programs and there's uh, local programs and your lender deals with these every day. So be sure and check with your lender, find out what you may qualify based on who you are and uh, what your needs are. Another one that I really warn you against is taking all the money out of your bank account to make this happen. Don't go that close to the line. Something is bound to go wrong and you better have a backup plan, uh, some money in the bank. So if you've put down your uh, big deposit and you've got your loan going, you've got, paid for your uh, inspection, you want to put in carp, carpet and paint before you're done, before you move in, you've got all this money going out, and then you get in the house, you better make sure there's something in the back uh, alley for you because uh, your axle could break on your car. Um, you could get uh, need a root canal and that goes 800 bucks quick. Um, 
the, the hot water heater could go out and there's 1500 bucks. So you've got to have some money back up. Don't take it all out just to get into a house. Find something that will allow you to have some reserves for sure. And the last one is something that some people don't think about and get in trouble uh, because they've gotten their loan, they've gotten the uh, house under contract, and they are set to go. So they go out and they buy $10,000 worth of furniture and put it on credit. Or they book up that dream um, vacation because they deserve it. Or maybe it's a new car they want. So they get out a loan for that. All these things are big mistakes until after the loan closes. Mainly because the lender, when they first give you your loan, they've pulled your credit, they know how much money you've got coming in, they know where all your money is going out. And if all of a sudden you've got another loan or credit card going, uh, that's another strike against your credit rating for one thing. And also it shows them that now you've got more money going out with no additional income. So that doesn't look too good. So they may think that you're not quite as good a risk. They may just drop you altogether. More likely they just raise your interest rate, maybe a half a point or something to cover. So they feel better about you. So don't make that mistake either. Um, go ahead and have fun. I hope these things have been helpful. Let me down, down in the comments if you've got any questions and uh, I love helping you out. Bye. So here we are back live. Actually, that was live, but uh, now I just wanted to remind you that uh, here's a couple of additional videos that you might find of interest and would help you out in your uh, learning about Colorado Springs. Another opportunity to uh, subscribe to the channel and hit the button again. Here's my contact info. If you'd like, I always respond to comments down below and a thumbs up is always appreciated. So until then, Good luck out there. It's tough if you're a buyer, but not impossible. We have hundreds of buyers every month buying a house. Let me help you be one of them. Have a good one. Bye.